Dobry večer. Good evening. This evening's proceedings will be conducted in English. However, if somebody would like to speak Ukrainian during the Q&A, I will happily translate for you. My name is Stefko Bandera. I am glad to be back in Toronto, and I am honored today to be presenting to you Nolan Peterson, a uh, uh, storied conflict journalist and author whose adventures have taken him through seven continents. He's reported on the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and most recently in Ukraine. And for that, perhaps, um, uh, we as a Ukrainian community could be most grateful because for uh, many, we find ourselves in a situation where we're constantly reminding our fellow fellow Canadians and Americans that there is a war, in fact, on in Ukraine. And Nolan's writings have uh, helped um, have helped to press that issue and illustrate it, for Nolan is a writer. He's um, a graduate of the Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. And uh, as opposed to soldiers who try to write and writers who try to fight, uh, Nolan's somebody who combines the two and is, uh, and is a writer. And for those of you who have uh, purchased the book and procured a copy already, um, Why Soldiers Miss War, The Journey Home, seven chapters spanning 98 to 2017. Uh, 24 photos in the book, including of his wife, Nina, who is Ukrainian. Nolan has lived in uh, Ukraine for six years now, and uh, happily married in Kyiv, and um, seven chapters spanning 98 to 2017, and one of the fellows that we are going to meet in this book and subsequently this evening, Nolan will tell us a little bit more about a fellow by the name of Daniel Kasyanenko. And I'll take the liberty of just reading a short passage from Nolan's book where we meet Daniel. When the shelling grows louder, you feel a need to be around others. If you're sleeping in your bunk, perhaps reading or listening to music, and the walls start to shake from artillery, it's an automatic reaction to get up and walk to the kitchen table where the others are gathered. You sit down, they pour you a drink, you clink glasses. They nod and smile at you, slap you on the back, and then it's all okay. Your fear clears like an early morning mist in the sun. A warm, calming shiver flows through you from head to toe, better than a shot of hard alcohol. We were sitting around the table like that one night, this is in Piske, after dinner, when a 19-year-old soldier named Daniel Kasyanenko came by for a visit. It was dark when he arrived, hours past when he was supposed to have left his post. He had been in a battle that evening, he said, a bad one. There was sniper and machine gun fire and artillery falling all around. He wasn't even able to shoot back, he said, because it was so intense. He could only low crawl through the trenches to find cover and wait it out. Yet, when describing the battle, he said, it was really awesome really awesome. He gave a thumbs up and smiled broadly. So without further ado, and uh, to learn more about Daniel Kasyanko, let's welcome Nolan Peterson. Do you um, write freelance, which you didn't tell us? 
and, and um, it also a tongue came up with at any moment did you really feel it, that you could die instant fear of your life or was it just a more general one the other other couple of things he mounted um, in, in one sentence um, is Pepsky still in government control and um, did, do you speak um, Ukrainian or Russian so when you were dead with the soldiers were you able to um, converse with you? Maybe you speak the better now since you're married and living with you. <laughs> you probably do speak it better now. Better than you. <laughs> so I, I, at all. I uh, <coughs> originally I was a freelancer and my work is uh, over the years has been almost all of it's been republished on Newsweek quite frequently but I've been a contributor to CNN and uh, interviews and articles for Fox News, BBC. Um, I, I have a very lucky situation. As a writer, I actually get a monthly paycheck from the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, and I write for them, uh, which also is something I'm very, uh, I feel very fortunate about because I've had the opportunity to go to D.C. I'd actually spoken at the National Security Council, spoken to people uh, in Congress on the Hill trying to relay the same things I talked about here today to lawmakers in Washington. Uh, but yeah, my work has it's gone out to dozens of sites over the years. But the Daily Signal is a news site of the Heritage Foundation, so the majority of my work is there. Uh, and the Key Post republishes I mean, most of my work as well. So if you Google Nolan Peterson Ukraine, you'll see you know, about three or four hundred articles from the last six, six years. So. Um, Fear of death. Is it really acute? It is. There have been <coughs> definite times when it's been acute. Um, when snipers shoot at me, that was really scary. Um, there was one time when I was with some soldiers walking through a field, and we heard we were walking. We were, we were stupid. We all stopped and we congregated in one spot. And when we did that, I heard, we all heard the sound of a drone overhead. And it spurred us to keep on walking. And no kidding, maybe you know, 10 seconds later, a tank shot at us. And it missed us by just maybe a dozen yards or so. And there's actually a video of it on YouTube. You can hear the, the shell go right by and it exploded. It exploded right where we had been standing when we heard the drone. And that's just. Right. As a former combatant, I can tell you, using drones to target tank shots is not something that a coal miner or a factory driver, you know, a factory worker in the Donbass could learn how to do without professional military instruction. So that, for me, was a dead giveaway that you have Russian units out there operating against the Ukrainians. Uh, for language, I'm sorry to say that I can't speak Ukrainian very well, but I certainly understand it. Uh, when I'm out in the front lines, I've uh, I've learned how to understand Ukrainian, but I do speak uh, some Russian. Um, I spent most of my time in the East where a lot of Russian is the most common language spent, uh, spoken. And also I always wanted to be able to converse with the Russians should I ever be captured. I thought that was really important for me to learn how to do. The first thing I learned how to say was, Ya ni spion. But I've got a it's a common thing in the military. I got a nice American flag tattooed on my right shoulder, so I think I'm, I'm a goner if I ever got captured. <laughs> um, and Pisky, yes, yeah, yes, it is it's still in, in government control. Uh, after the battle for the Donetsk airport, which the Ukrainians ultimately pulled back from the Donetsk airport, uh, Pisky was where had, they had staged most of the artillery for that battle, and so they retreated. That's kind of their fallback position. But it has remained under government government control, uh, and there's still daily fighting there every day. Um, it's you know what you saw in 2015 is not any different than what it still is is today. It's constant fighting, uh, and also by the way, if you ever read OSCE reports, you know the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the people who are charged with monitoring the ceasefire. If they they say there's been 15 ceasefire violations today. It's important to note that each ceasefire violation is not one shot fired. It could be an entire battle with lots and hundreds and hundreds of rounds fired, and that's 
they quantum, they kind of lump all that together into one ceasefire violation. So I think when some Western outlets report, you know, 15 ceasefire violations in one day, it doesn't give you an accurate sense of how widespread and intense some of that fighting still is. So, thank you for the questions. Yes. I got a question over here. Um, in terms of um, you mentioned about keeping the population informed, um, especially in today's more divided, I'd say, political uh, landscape, uh, what is the best way to uh, ensure people are aware of the situation? Um, when a lot of people are just vocal and ignorant, I find um, they're more than happy to put their head in the, head in the sand. And, you know. You're looking at it. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, I think, I mean, not to all joking aside, I think what the Ukrainian community here in Toronto, St. Catharines, Buffalo, Rochester, they invested money to have me come and make the rounds speaking to people. That's important. Bring people who can speak truth to what they've seen. I think that in this era of, you know, all this disinformation that we get from Russia, when you have eyewitnesses who have been there personally and seen these things that can come back and tell the truth, that really matters. Um, I think on a more societal level, as a journalist, I think that you know, one way to fight back against this massive amount of disinformation we now face is we have to be better educated when we consume news. And that starts with our kids at school to teach people to not rely on Facebook to choose which stories we go to every day. Don't rely on Google or Twitter to tell you what to do. Purposefully seek out news sources that you think you can trust and that cover a broad spectrum of ide you know, political ideologies too. Read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And somewhere between the two is the truth, right? So I think you know, there's really no way to, short of shutting down the internet, to prevent countries from like Russia, China, and Iran from you know, pumping lots of disinformation out there. I think the defense has to come at home where we have to be a little less lazy about how we get our news and to put a little energy into diversifying our resources and to not let news come at us in a passive process. We should be choosing how we get our news, not letting some algorithm that Mark Zuckerberg came up with deciding which stories we're reading every day. Uh, for the Ukrainian community, but I think that you know you all have a, a great opportunity uh, doing events like this and maybe even, I don't know, you know, sponsoring a journalist to go to Ukraine for three or four months. I really believe that it's essential. Like, you look at all the top media outlets, it's their Moscow correspondent who's always reporting on Ukraine. And they'll fly in for two or three days, have their fixer pick them up at the airport, they got interviews lined up, they do it, and they bounce, go back to Moscow and write their story. And I, I know some of those journalists, and they're good journalists. But the thing is, you can't learn the truth coming in for a couple days due to interviews and leaving. You, like, there is real value to living in the country about which you report. And so I think that there needs to be more journalists, American and Canadian journalists, or journalists from the West more broadly, living in the country or reporting on it. I mean, I think it's crazy that in Ukraine, I could probably name on one hand <laughs> easily the amount of American journalists who even live semi-permanently in Ukraine. I can think of maybe two other Americans who live there full time. That's, I think, with, you know, as far as covering Europe's only ongoing land war, that seems a little bit crazy to me that there's so little pre media presence uh, in the country. Uh, is, is there a site to go to to find what happened in the tank battle of uh, Mariupol? I've heard something about it two years ago about uh, the various. Uh, strategies used and uh, but I never really did find out where to go to see something about it in your opinion. You can read some of my reporting from the time okay. or, or buy my book because I Sorry, describe in detail the battle from Mary Opal. <laughs> Here's your book. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wrote about it in detail. There's and um, I think actually this is an interesting but sort of an outlier but there's some RAND, R-A-N-D, so the U.S. government's defense think tank, right. they did some analysis of those battles in the early part of the war, and it really highlights how Russia started off with this hybrid warfare plan, right? 
they're going to cloak their war in the Donbass as a separatist civil war uprising. But the Ukrainians kicked their butt. Even with this ragtag force of this, you know, the regular army in Ukraine at that time was just a, a dilapidated, ineffective force. But those volunteer battalions rose up, went out there, and rolled back the Russian advance using overwhelming force, and they completely just annihilated Russia's hybrid warfare plan. And it wasn't until Russia saw that, and they wanted to save face, that they decided to outright invade Ukraine in August 2014 with their own troops, you know, tanks, artillery, and that's how the lies happened, because the Ukrainians weren't fighting you know, so-called separatists, they were actually fighting the regular Russian military at that point. So is that anything like that George C. Scott when he played Patton, and they had that tank battle? You've seen that movie, I, I oh. It was more like the movie Fury. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was surreal. Yes, you've answered one of my questions, how many other journalists are there out there sort of uh, on, on the battlefield, uh, or with, with the Ukrainian troops, but have you had, since your book came out, any requests from universities to speak further on, uh, on uh, your particular uh, experiences? Uh, not since the book came out in particular, but I have spoken uh, at some institutions before. I, I had a chance to speak at the U.S. Air Force Academy in my alma mater uh, last year, which is, which is really nice. But yes, I, I want to speak to more universities and more students. Because I think it's, now I don't want to seem too doom and gloom with the things I said at the end of my speech about the possibility of another major land war, another world war. But I have to say, when you watch a tank battle, or you're sitting in a trench on an artillery barrage, it makes you think that these things really could happen. And so I think it is imperative for young people who don't remember September 11th, who don't remember the, just the visceral reality, what it feels like. I'm talking about in, in the United States, but I'm sure Canada was equally as shocked and horrified by that day as any, any American was. But just, if you don't have that visceral feeling of what it's like to be attacked, then I think a lot of younger people today just don't get the seriousness of the, of the threats out there in the world today. And that, you know, you know, Vladimir Putin is not a leader who is going to pump the brakes on his ambitions not the same as video games. <laughs> Voluntarily, he's going to be, have to be stopped. Yeah. And I think some people just don't understand that reality and that we don't live in this utopia. We still live in the same world where the same rules as the 1930s exist, you know? And so I think people don't get that. Uh, Nolan, yeah. um, we certainly enjoyed uh, your speech in many respects, and uh, this crowd very much appreciates it. But I would like to ask you something which has happened not too long time ago in the United States that has a relative relationship to what's happening in Ukraine. The uh, US senator a few weeks ago got something like 40 signatures from people who are within the Senate that are defining the so-called volunteer soldiers in Ukraine that you mentioned, by the way. And he called them, guess what, terrorists. What are your comments? What do you think this idea comes from? And why such a thing coming from the US Senate? Excellent question. They've been, well, the why is easy. They've been manipulated, they've been manipulated by Russian propaganda and believe in that. Listen, you, I served in the US military for over a decade. And the number of far right extremists in the US military, in my estimation, exceeds the percentage of far right extremists in the Ukrainian military. They exist, but they exist in every country in the world. And of course, Russian propaganda will find the bad apples, and they'll present that as a false depiction of the majority of people uh, you know, representative of that group. I, I'm disappointed that uh, those senators would be, they're senators, you mentioned, that they would be uh, manipulated by that. I think they're probably just going for a low-hanging fruit, political victory. Of course, everybody's against far-right extremists, um, but, I mean, it is a fact that the Ukrainian, number one, the Maidan was not a CIA orchestrated putsch that installed a neo-Nazi government in Kyiv. 
Ukrainians decided they had enough corruption. They had enough Russian influence in their country. My wife is a 24-year-old woman who's out there protesting on the Maidan because she wants a better life. She wants to believe that it's worth staying in Ukraine and having a future there. Brave young people are out there willing to die for that. And to have my country, or representatives of my country, accusing them of being terrorists, it's an insult. Ukrainians are fighting for my country's values. They deserve better than that. The makeup of the Russian army, ethnic Russians, and then you've got all the other republics. Any idea? Not percentage wise, but like mostly who is it made up of? Yeah, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you something that's interesting is that I have some friends of mine who fought at the Balsava, and the, the, the battle there was with, a, was with regular Russian units. And those Russian regular units comprised an overwhelming majority within their ranks comprised of Russian conscripts from the Far East. All right? And the reason is they didn't want to draft soldiers from Moscow or St. Petersburg where they could get some political flack for the deaths. Uh, so Russia has leaned heavily on conscript soldiers from outlying provinces where they can minimize or hide the, the, uh, the combat deaths that they face in the Donbass. Today, in the day-to-day -day fighting in the Donbass, the majority of the Soldiers pulling triggers are Ukrainians, separatists, and the Russians primarily operate in a command and control capacity. Uh, but in the past, at some of the major battles, like Elovaisk, the Balsava, it's primarily been Russian regular units that Ukrainians have faced. I mean, one of the crazy parts of this war, too, is the, you know, these, the mercenaries. You have mercenaries from Chechnya. That's been a major contingent. But you also have soldiers from Serbia who come, because they heard that there were Croats fighting for the Ukrainians, and so they wanted a chance to kill people from Croatia to air some bad blood. So, again, for the record, the war in Ukraine is not a civil war, but I think if there's a historical analog to the war, I, I would say the Spanish Civil War is a good comparison. Because I, I believe in Ukraine right now, we are seeing sort of the bellwether for the great ideological clash that's going on in the world between those forces which, which want to save democracy or fight for democracy and those nihilistic forces which want to destroy democracy at all costs, represented by Russia and obviously those who support Russia and fight for Russia's proxies in the Donbass. Just wanted to thank the organizers and thank you immensely for what you're doing. Thank you very much. information comes from Deborah American National. So if uh, and I'm curious about other conservatives in the Heritage Foundation. So what do they think when somebody like Pompeo comes out mm -hmm. and says Ukraine doesn't matter? Or when they hear Trump say something that Ukraine is corrupt and they were the hackers and not the Russians. Yeah, so you know, I, I'm not gonna comment in, on any specific statements by any US politicians because that's the fastest way for me to end up on mm -hmm. YouTube, right? <laughs> and to get an angry tweet in my direction. Um, but I'll just say again that Ukrainians represent the best of our country's values. And that it's disappointing that they should be dragged into any partisan bickering in the United States. It's not fair. Uh, if there's one country in the world, like you see a lot of disruptive forces trying to tear down democracy right now. Right? You look around Europe, you see all these political parties rising from the shadows, which are you know, basically trying to undermine the democratic principles which have sustained Europe since World War II. But Ukraine is one country fighting pr to preserve these things. They're fighting to join our way of life. You know, I, when I brought my wife to the United States for the first time, uh, she kept saying that like, this is the life she wants. 
But she was also shocked how much Americans took it for granted what they had. And so I, I just think that it's a shame that there is a country out there that truly believes, and I say this as an American, but in the American dream, right? In the idea of democracy and freedom and that you know, you can, there is no ceiling on your life. You can achieve whatever you aspire to. They believe in these things and they're fighting for it and I feel like it is a betrayal of what they're fighting for and therefore a betrayal of my own country's values to equate Ru uh, Ukraine in any way to Russia and to belittle, I mean, Ukraine's corruption is an inheritance of a corrupt Russia organized system which Ukrainians are fighting to get rid of. And Ukraine, if you say Ukraine's a corrupt country, well they've fought and they've done a hell of a lot to get rid of that corruption. They've, that corruption, which by the way was implanted upon them by the Soviet system and the Russian controlled system in the 1990s. So I think that that is a false picture of Ukraine that they don't deserve and I think that there need to be more voices out there among conservatives, in particular right now, saying the truth. I can say without a fact that the Heritage Foundation supports Ukraine and believes in the Ukraine cause. They've, they've never wavered from that. I've been proud of that. Some great people at the Heritage Foundation have done a lot to promote Ukraine in Washington, D.C. and trying their best. I mean, the Heritage Foundation, when Colonel Vindman, we all know him, right? When he took his job, they sent me to brief him about the situation in the war zone. So there is a good relationship there and Ukraine uh, Ukraine's fight is still a priority for the organization I work for. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you were in Galilee. Yes. Um, at the you know, NATO trading center. I was wondering if you went to uh, somebody who was where the U.S. Special Forces were training their, their now parts. I've spoken to people involved with that, but I haven't had a chance to personally observe it. Um, but on that topic more broadly, I can tell you that uh, the creation, or at least the renaissance of Ukraine's special forces unit, special operations forces, has been really incredible. And you're seeing some of the fruits of that uh, with some of these uh, operations which are going on in the Donbass, which don't get a lot of attention, but uh, Ukraine's Spetsnaz forces are definitely uh, much more capable than they have been. And I think that's one quiet way in which the United States is helping Ukraine. And I think, you know, a, a really important point to note, as I said earlier, like I don't want to belittle the importance of U.S. military aid or <coughs> Canadian military aid to Ukraine, but the fact is the war in the Donbass is not, like, I think one false narrative is that Ukraine's hanging on by a thread, and the minute that U.S. military aid goes away, the Donbass war, like, Ukraine's survival is not dependent on the continued flow of U.S. military aid. U.S. and Canadian military aid is most useful to help Ukraine prepare to fight the next war, to build a military that can stop a Russian invasion. That's where our help is really useful right now. And that's in our best interest, because a strong Ukraine is certainly a deterrent from Russia overstepping its bounds and accidentally starting, accidentally starting a war with a NATO country, which would, of course, uh, lead to a war that involves all of us. So I think that, that special operations example is a great example of the fact that our assistance to Ukraine is not just sending bullets and javelins and whatnot. We're helping rebuild their air force, their navy, their special operations forces. We've changed their, their military culture. It's been a huge change. We're, back in 2014 when I arrived, they still have this Soviet model where, you know, some fat general smoking a cigarette back at a command post near Kyiv is directing the chess pieces of the war. Whereas in the US or NATO model of command and control of the military, you empower junior officers and frontline NCOs to be able to adapt to the realities of combat and make decisions in real time based on combat realities about what's best for their soldiers. And that's the model that Ukraine, Ukraine has shifted to, which certainly helps them to fight this war. It makes them more interoperable with NATO forces. And it's made them, I think, much more agile and uh, much more, on a unit-by-unit unit basis, superior probably to Russia's forces, because Russia still operates under that Soviet mindset, whereas Ukraine's forces are now shifting, and they have shifted almost completely to the American-style chain of command, which empowers frontline troops to fight as they best see fit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We had a question.
wish we were here. How do you notice any differences in the war zone since the, the last presidential election with the Ukraine, which has ushered in a different policy when it comes to the army and the peacemaking process? Has it, has it been felt on the ground? No. <laughs> I mean, the, the pace of fighting uh, has not relented since the Zelensky instituted his push for peace. Um, I think overall the conflict has diminished in intensity significantly over the years. Um, but like I said, just just last week we saw a pretty significant uh, escalation uh, when the Ukrainian forces occupied an observation post in the only land and the, the Russian forces pushed back against that and pushed the Ukrainians out of their position. But I would say that overall, the intensity of combat has not significantly changed since the peace process has begun. And morale? Because Poroshenko was a big proponent of, of strengthening the army, and um, since his, he, he's no longer the president, has that had an effect on army morale? Or? I think that when you, when you talk about morale of the Ukrainian troops, I say it's, it's high, but they're frustrated. Because they just, they, they want to attack. They want to attack. They want to get back to their territory after all these years. They want to reclaim what is sovereign Ukrainian territory from Russian control. And I think that frustration uh, is heightened now. I don't think, I wouldn't say morale has been dampened by what Zelensky is doing. But I do think the soldiers are angry, particularly the veterans are angry that there may be some concession that negates what they've been fighting for for the last six years. There is also frustration, I must say, because when MiGs-2 was, was signed in February 2015, the balance of power differential between Ukraine and Russia was much, much different than it is today. Ukraine's military is a far cry from what it was in February 2015. Ukraine's economy has significantly improved from that time. Ukraine's general uh, mood of optimism across the country has improved. Young Ukrainians can now travel without a visa throughout Europe. Ukraine has religious independence. Ukrainians are invested and believe in their democracy much more now, and so Ukraine's democracy has a much surer footing than it was in 2015. I think the, the point that I'm getting at is a lot of veterans and soldiers are saying, okay, why now? For, for five years, we've continued to fight and we've kind of given Russia the stiff arm about implementing elections in the Donbass before all their troops have left. So why now are we willing to concede on this point? When we have the strongest bargaining position we've ever had, why now? And I think a lot of soldiers are willing to keep on fighting uh, to not succumb to what Russia wants to do, which is essentially to create a situation where Russia can elect deputies into Ukraine's Rada which is sort of, that's the, that's the reason they included elections in the Minsk II agreement, was that they could basically control the Donbass while the people there vote for parliamentary representatives. But, so, long story short, I say that morale is still high, the Ukrainian forces are stronger and they're better trained, and they are confident in their strength and their position, but I think they are frustrated that there is a push to find a a expedite, an expedited solution to this conflict, where the battlefield reality is that there is no like, there's no pressure on them to do this right now. Do we have a question? Uh, we can continue our discussions with Nolan. If you have individual questions uh, after the talk, with the purchase of a book and signing, but I'm sure Nolan can talk if you don't buy a book. <laughs> It'd be good if <laughs> But we have, uh, I have a, one question from, uh, that was submitted in written form, and that has to do with how did you meet your Ukrainian wife? <laughs> Best thing that ever happened. So, I'll give you the backstory. I, uh, when I left the military, I went through something which I think is quite common for many veterans, particularly veterans who have been in <coughs> combat, and that's, I felt uh, like I'd lost my purpose in life. 
I felt like I had lost my identity. I went to the Air Force Academy when I was 18, and I left the military when I was 30 years old. So I had never been an adult outside the military. I didn't even know how to wear a suit or rent a civilian apartment. You know? um, and I remember putting my bags in my car, leaving my base, and driving out the gate for the last time, just thinking to myself, now what? What do I do? Who am I? And so I think I sought to recreate that sense of purpose and meaning in my life. And that sense of purpose and meaning, which I thought I had lost when I left the military. And initially, I did that by becoming a war correspondent and going out and meeting brave soldiers from my country, the Kurds in Iraq. I spent a lot of time with them in the Battle of Mosul. And obviously, six years living in Ukraine and reporting on the war. I felt among those soldiers like I had recreated that sense of tribe, and camaraderie, and purpose in my life that I'd lost while I was in the military. But it was a downward spiral for me too because I kept taking greater and greater risks and I've lost friends over the years, including James, about whom I spoke earlier tonight. And it wasn't until I met my wife, Lily, in, in Kiev. She was a university student at the time, and I was out at dinner with one of my friends and saw this beautiful woman across the way and approached her and asked for her number. Uh, like a cool guy, I waited about six hours to call her. <laughs> the next morning, and all, she had a powwow with her friends to decide whether or not she should hang out with this weird American guy. And at first she thought I was just a, a tourist who's looking for somebody to you know, walk around and see the sights of Kiev for a day. She didn't realize we were on a date until I kissed her at the end of it. And, and she changed her mind about me. <laughs> yeah, we fell in love and uh, through her love, I found a sense of purpose and meaning and direction in my life, which superseded anything I ever felt in the war. What language and after, do you speak to each other? Uh, we speak English. She speaks very well in English. Much better than I do in Russian. <laughs> um, yeah, and so now I've, I've, through her love, I've found my direction of life, and I have broken my addiction to war. <coughs> and that is the subject of my book. I no longer miss it. Ми 